Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I want to talk about the third edition of the Oxford American Writer's Thesaurus. Now the first thing you may be thinking is, uh, okay dude, that is a printed thesaurus. Can't you just go to dictionary.com uh, or something like that and just look up the word? Uh, they even have cool tools where you can choose the complexity of a synonym or an antonym. Uh, and get contextual uh, annotations and so on. But here is my main argument, besides, of course, the fact that I am a printed book uh, Puritan. Um, I have two reasons for it. <clears throat> the most salient one being the fact that uh, as a writer, um, being connected is such a distraction. I unfortunately don't have the willpower um, to stave off checking my phone or, or uh, getting distracted uh, by different things on the internet when I'm trying to write. So what I like to do is choose a place to go and sit down uh, without a phone or an iPad or a computer <clears throat> or anything like that and really focus on the writing. And so because of that, um, I like to take a printed thesaurus and a printed dictionary uh, with me for that endeavor. So all I have are my writing implements uh, and my reference books. This way, I don't quickly do you know, a Google search or a dictionary.com search um, and then see some notification or start to wonder, uh, hey, I wonder if I have any new comments here or, uh, well, let me check my email really quickly. You get the idea. The other thing, uh, which is kind of secondary um, and it may just be more my imagination than anything, is that as you're flipping through the pages, of a printed thesaurus or dictionary looking for your word, um, your, your eyes are constantly grazing other words. Um, and I tend to think that this is, um, this is actually useful. I believe that they're actually getting uh, loaded in there um, into, into a part of your memory. Some of the features of this printed edition now, of course, um, certainly they got together and they said, okay, how can we make this stand out against all of the uh, digital um, offerings of thesauri and dictionaries and so on. And, uh, and so some of the features, there's a, there's a Ford in here by Rick Moody of uh, the novels The Ice Storm and Purple America. Um, and there's an introduction by Ben Zimmer. Um, and they're both really good. But Rick Moody's is, a, is really a standout. Even though it's really short, it's called The Chain of Associations. Um, and it's, it, it tells the reason uh, why he came to <clears throat> the Oxford American Writers Thesaurus. So it's very illuminating uh, and justifying for, for the purchase. There are also these word toolkits, um, which if we look at one of them, you can see here's a word toolkit for the word formidable. And it is in the uh, form of a word cloud. Um, and it shows, based on, of course, the size of the words, um, the most common paired word with that, uh, with that adjective or, or whatever word it may be. And the cool thing uh, about that <coughs> is that it isn't just something that the editor sat and came up with. Um, they actually used uh, data for those word, word clouds from the word sketch facility of the Oxford English Corpus, which is a database of more than two billion words of real 21st century English from around the world. There are also very, uh, there are copious and diverse quotes using words um, that appear on the pages all throughout the book, and I mean they're taken from uh, popular television to talk shows, uh, economists, TED Talks I think I saw, uh, we're in here, and of course, great literature throughout the ages. Um, I'll just give two of the examples that are in here. Um, one is for the word celebrity, and this comes from John Updike, his self-consciousness memoirs from 1989, and Updike says, celebrity is a mask that eats into the face. Another word is radical, um, and they use a quote from Hannah Arendt, um, and it says, the most radical revolutionary will become a conservative 
on the day after the revolution. I love that. Um, and you can see they have them there set apart in these little quotation call-outs. In the middle, there are also these thematic lists. There are all these lists, and I'm a sucker for lists, um, but there's a thematic word list, which of course goes through, you know, animals, and then breaks it down into mammals, reptiles, and so on. Uh, dance, clothing, food and drink, furniture, geography, plants, <clears throat> but there are also lists of archaic words, Latin phrases, literary words, like rhetorical devices, um, abbreviations used in electronic communication even to try and make this thing, you know, uh, relevant for the 21st century. And what's more, they have emoticons on page 52 of this middle section. By far, the second greatest thing that pushed me to purchase a copy of this thesaurus is that there are over 200 contributions by noted writers, including, as it says right on the front cover, um, and which name stand, stood out to me the most, David Foster Wallace. And I thought to myself, okay, these are probably just quotations, you know, that they culled, um, just like some of the others I just read from Hannah Arendt and so on. But no, they're actual contributions. Uh, Joshua Ferris, Zadie Smith, David Foster Wallace, uh, Michael Derrida, there are um, these writers write about a given word. And so I'll just give a couple of examples here. David Foster Wallace gives us his reflection on the word feckless and effet or effet. A totally great adjective. One reason is that the slippage in the meaning of effet is okay, is that we have, is that we can use feckless to express what effet used to mean which is depleted of vitality, washed out, exhausted. Feckless primarily means deficient in efficacy, lacking vigor or determination, feeble. But it can also mean careless, profligate, irresponsible. The word appears most often now in connection with wastoid youths, bloated bureaucracies, anyone who's culpable for his own haplessness. The great thing about using feckless is that it lets you be extremely dismissive and mean without sounding mean. You just sound witty and classy. The words also fun to use because of the soft E assonance and the K sound, and the triply assonant noun form, fecklessness, is even more fun. This is just classic David Foster Wallace. You can tell this is him writing it. Here's a good one from Zadie Smith for the word pulvinate or pulvinated. And she says, when seeking adjectives for soft, rounded things, especially on a woman's body, we too often fall at the first hurdle and choose the very tired Mills and Boone favorite, pillowy. And yet, there is a ready-made word for the occasion, Latinate, graceful, specifically intended for things that are cushiony and cushion-like, that swell and bulge. The pulvinated face of a duck. The pulvinate curve of your lover's breast. Much better. Here's one from David Auburn on the word pulchritude. He says, while very useful as a synonym for sex appeal, it shouldn't be understood to mean sexy in the manner of the modern, desiccated, zombie-eyed runway model. Indeed, it stands as a rebuke to that contemporary beauty standard, evoking as it does the plush, statuesque, overabundance associated with broad Broadway chorines of an earlier era. As a bonus, you also catch a whiff of the trying to be euphemistic but still vulgar vaudeville patrons ogling them. And finally, Michael Derda on the word very. Early on, we are taught to be leery of very and similar intensives, exceptionally, especially. Indeed, if writers had to do without one of the eight parts of speech, the adverbs would probably be least missed. Yet, very is among the few words that gains in effectiveness when repeated. There was definitely something moving around the darkened room. Frightened, Mildred turned the doorknob very, very quietly. The doubling of very slows the sentence down and conveys a more palpable sense of Mildred's trepidation. Nevertheless, be very, very cautious about using this common adverb, and do so only after thinking twice. 
So as you can see, these authors, you know, these are not by any means dry, uh, scholarly or lofty contributions. While they do express uh, the experience that these authors have with language and writing, um, they're also very playful and very fun. And, and I find myself flipping through this from time to time, just reading through the contributions. So I highly suggest the Oxford American Writer's Thesaurus in the third edition, if for nothing else than the uh, original writer contributions that you can enjoy. Whether you're a writer or not, um, we should all do things, do whatever we can to increase our vocabulary and have fun with language.